Hey guys, I'm going to be talking today about the importance of non-bee insects in crop pollination and how important they are, so what do they contribute. And um, So there was a study that came out in 2016, so not too long ago, by um, Rader et al. Um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, so a pretty prestigious, definitely a prestigious journal. Um, about this topic, and a lot of this information is going to come from from their um, from their work. It was a really great study. It basically re was a review of 39 other studies across five different continents studying crop pollination and how it was being crops were being pollinated by different types of insects. So, usually when we think of crop pollination, we think of bees because they are typically thought of as the most important pollinators of crops especially. Um, and in certain areas that is definitely true, I would say North America for sure. Um, but it really depends on the crop and it depends on where you are geographically um, and climatically. And is that a word, climatically? Um, anyway, um, so they, like I said, they studied they compiled this research from 39 other studies and did a review. And what they basically found was that non-bee visits, so visits that were done by other insects like um, beetles and wasps and uh, lepidopterans, so butterflies and moths, um, what am I saying, flies, all of those other types of insects that can be pollinators made up um, approximately 25 to 50 percent of the total number of flower visits within they considered it about an average of 40 um, percent of all the flower visits were being done by these other insects which is actually a huge proportion 40 percent 25 to 50 percent any of those numbers in there is still really really significant so um, they found that although these non-bee insects were less effective pollinators than bees are per flower visit, they made more visits in general, so they ended up providing pollination services that are similar to what bees provide. So bees are specifically adapted to pollination. You know, that's what they evolved to do. Um, they co-evolved with plants, the flowering plants, and so they, you know, have specialized hairs all over their bodies that are really good at, um, at capturing pollen and um, keeping pollen on their body. They have, you know, these long proboscises, tongues, that allow them to drink up nectar. Some bees also collect oils, so they have specialized things on their body for that. And really their whole, um, you know, the whole makeup of their body is in tune with that particular need because they get the, all of their food resources from flowers. So they're really, really good at that. They're really effective at it. And these non-bees, maybe that's not their only food source. Maybe, um, you know, in the case of a wasp, they're carnivorous insects, but they go to flowers and they drink up um, nectar for um, like the, just the carbohydrate, the sugar source. And that's the case for a lot of these other insects. But um, they end up combined, all these other insects combined, end up visiting the flowers more often, even though they're not as effective each time they land on a flower pollinating it. So they end up producing about the same pollination services as bees do, is what this study is claiming. So um, they also say that non-bees are not as reliant on the surrounding landscape as bees are, um, and that would probably make their pollination services more robust to changes in land use. So basically bees are really reliant, I'm talking about wild bees here specifically, really reliant on um, the surrounding landscape. There's been a lot of studies showing that the landscape matrix, so like how the landscape is made up um, are we talking about developed areas? Are we talking about um, natural areas? That sort of thing. Um, the way that that is um, that 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 matrix is made up of over the over a particular land area really impacts whether or not that area is able to support bee populations. And so what they found is that on farms, the closer you are basically to 
natural landscapes, typically the more pollination services the crops are going to get, and they've showed this for various different crops. And that is probably because um, wild bees have particularly particular nesting requirements and other requirements that a farm simply can't provide, especially the type of monoculture farms that we see a lot of um, a lot of times. So, um, you know, a lot of wild bees are ground nesters, so they need a particular sort of soil conditions. They need areas that aren't constantly being tilled and sprayed with um, pesticides and fungicides and herbicides. Um, they have particular requirements that only these natural landscapes can provide. Whereas these non-bees, this study is saying, are not as uh, reliant on the natural landscape as bees are, so they um, are going to be more resilient or robust in terms of change in that land area. So if that land goes from the natural area to being turned into more farmland or being developed in some way, these non-bees are going to be more resilient to it, apparently. So the study also says that therefore they can act as like an insurance policy against these bee population declines that we're seeing um, more and more evidence of. And so, you know, the case has been made that the wild bees are sort of an insurance policy against the decline of the honeybee and all the problems we're seeing with honeybees simply because, you know, just having more diversity is going to buffer against these losses. And, you know, if we're depending on just one species or just a handful of species to do all these um, pollination services, we're putting ourselves at risk for, um, you know, collapse of that system if one of those bees goes um, goes extinct or just, you know, isn't able to survive or is just too expensive to manage, then, um, you know, the, the, the farmers are going to suffer, which means the consumers are going to suffer, and you're not going to be able to, su to support and provide the number of crops that are needed to, to have a livelihood and um, to, to feed people, basically. So, so yeah, um, they basically found also that um, non-bees have a broader temporal activity, and they they pollinate at different times of day and in different types of weather conditions. They can even carry pollen further distances than some bees, and are and are more efficient at transferring pollen in some crops. So um, it really just depends on the crop. You know, in tropical systems, the um, the cacao plant, um, for instance, the the cacao pod, which is what uh, we make, um, we get cacao uh, seeds out of, which then we turn into cocoa butter, which then we get, a, we get chocolate from. Um, those are actually pollinated by this little midge, it's a little fly, and that's what pollinates that plant in the tropics, and um, we're currently experiencing what they're calling this cacao crisis because cacao is getting harder and harder to grow um, in a sustainable and profitable way. And um, it's really concerning, especially given the demand for chocolate that there is um, coming from, you know, the, the Western world especially. So, um, so that's just one example of a crop, a very important crop, especially to me, um, that really relies on a non-bee insect. And there's plenty of examples of that. And yeah, so they found that the non-bees, you know, fly at different times of day. The same thing goes for the wild bees. They've shown that um, the wild bees compared to honeybees, you know, they'll be out when it's raining. I've actually seen that. It'll start to kind of drizzle. And you'll still see the bees, the wild bees anyway, out there. Uh, the honeybees tend to retreat kind of quickly. And um, they also tend to come out later, a little bit later in the morning because, you know, they kind of have to wait for the morning sun to hit their hive and to warm them up and for them to get going and be able to leave the hive. Whereas these um, wild bees, especially if you think of a bumblebee, it's much more tolerant of cooler temperatures in the spring and um, other times of the year. These bumblebees are going to be able to thermoregulate or just have more body mass and more um, hair, basically, 
to be more resilient to cooler temperatures and so they'll be out when the honeybees are not out. So that's just another example of how the you know the, there's a great diversity in terms of the pollinators that are out there and how that can benefit crops. The total pollination services um, did not differ significantly among honeybees, wild bees, and non-bees is what they found. So the total pollination services was the product of visitation frequency and pollen deposition or fruit set per, per visit. So basically like the product of how often the crop was being visited and either pollen deposition, which is a pretty good measure of how well it's being pollinated, and or fruit set, which is another measure of that. They found that non-bees accounted for 38% of visits on average, which is a lot, wild bees was 23%, and honey bees was 39%. So there was no great difference between between those three values, 39%, 23%, 38%. Those are pretty similar numbers. They also found that assemblage composition would vary greatly across crop type and location. So within even three fields um, of canola or oil seed rate, in Sweden, the visitation by non-bees ranged from 5% to 60%. So that's a huge difference, and that was just in three fields of the same crop in the same general geographic area. They found this huge difference in terms of how much the non-bees were contributing. They basically found that um, the bees with less efficient pollen deposition may be most important um, in terms of pollination in certain years or certain seasons when they're at high abundance relative to other taxa. The pollination environment is known to be highly stochastic, um, so it varies very much uh, in terms of random um, events and it's kind of unpredictable. So, um, you know, one year there may be a boom in a particular species and they may do really well versus another species and so depending on the year you can see different levels of, of and different population. In, in my system, in watermelon, we see very few visits by um, by other insects. Um, I think the number is somewhere like 2% or some maybe 5% of the total visits are done by other insects. So I see wasps sometimes out there. I see, um, I've seen gulf fritillaries. There's definitely always wildflowers nearby um, in those particular fields, but, but they I've seen them kind of very, you know, particularly visiting the watermelon, going from watermelon flower to watermelon flower. Um, what else have I seen? I've seen definitely some surfed flies. I hope that was interesting. Leave any questions or comments you might have for me, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.